And I'm going to try to sync up the audio with maximize full screen in three, two, okay. So it looks like we're recording audio and video. A little choppy when you're doing the movement on Google Earth. So um, just so you know, um, it may be better to try to... Um, you know, keep it stable as much as possible, but obviously you're going to have to turn things around different ways, so that's fine. It's just a little choppy coming through the, the web. Okay. So, anyways. All right. Uh, just a little finish up on the, the last session that we were talking about, the job in Plaquemine, Louisiana. And... Okay, now this was the one uh, where we had the, was it the railways, or wait a minute, which one was it? It was where we had the re sort of the retaining wall coming over the, uh, like that mountain was built with. No, this was a wastewater treatment facility brand new to a small community, and through the politics and revenue that they decided to expand their water services to other areas, so they had to build a new a uh, clarifier and a con, con, uh, contact chloride, chlorine contact, chlorine contact chamber. Uh -huh. And so they spent about 1.2 million on new construction for this new, uh, facility. And before operation was less than a couple months old, that the EPA was coming in and sending them fines because it was around here. I didn't, go in deep to see where it was, but uh, along here, and this creek waterway was getting high high levels of chlorine that was leaking from the chlorine contact chamber. Long story short was they shut down the facility, and as the operations guys said, that it became a big turtle pond because, again, it was a big swimming pool that was had – very little water in the bottom. It just became muck, and I guess turtles liked it. I don't okay. know how they got in there, but that's the way it was. So when it went to litigation, the city of uh, the city of Plaquemin filed a suit against the contractor and the design firm because there were design flaws. Uh, by memory, I think they didn't have enough reinforcement in the walls and cracking developed and they had through wall cracks and water leaked in from the exterior. The water level is, is near, almost near ground level. This is the area in Louisiana where the tombs and the graveyards are above ground. Right, right, yeah. So we've all heard about the, the floating so caskets. It was, it was almost as if it was uh, poor engineering, it was poor uh, materials, it was just all the way around, just so, sort of a shortcut, half-assed uh, operation is what it sounds like to me. Yeah, and, and again, from a, for all of our work, it was a combination of construction, design, and materials. So when you get a little bit, one of those out of sync, then the other two become effective. And from a litigation standpoint, it's, well, how do we divide this up? The, how much was design a consideration in the damage? Right. How much was construction and how much was a materials issue? Say the supplier that when they came to the site and had the ready mix truck if the guy sat back there and added 50 gallons because it's a hot day or threw in a couple cans of coke to slick down the mix then that becomes an issue and again that's where materials is an issue that has nothing to do with design and probably now, how were how were people affected by this i mean were there any deaths or sicknesses or what was the really worst of repercussions of this i guess you could say sort of uh, seepage and leakage out of there yeah uh i don't know there were no to me no known sickness or illnesses related but again this waterway was where they found high concentrations of chlorine right chlorine got into the groundwater and again with everything else that's in the groundwater these days <laughs> it might have even helped it who knows right but from a from a a uh, cost standpoint is that they had a brand new facility that was of no use whatsoever. So it not only set them back the 1.2 million, they had to come up with a way to fix it and then get it back into operation, etc. Right. Because so, the, the reason I was asking about, you know, uh, 
how people were affected is because a lot of times you'll see these corporations that, you know, cut corners and cut costs in order to, you know, get things done, you know, on time or, you know, over profit or under budget or however you want to put it. But at the end of the day, it's all just a, it's, it's really just an insurance uh, policy, you know, where they're basically divvying out amounts of blame and all it amounts to is, you know, how much does this corporation have to pay or how much does this insurance company have to pay when at the end of the day, if is if a single person was responsible for say you know let's just say somebody had died because because of this um, then a single person would be you know in jail for manslaughter whereas a corporation you know it's just an insurance uh, uh, tick yep. and that's why you know I have such problems with the current political uh, idea that you know corporations are people and that's how they they're able to use uh, money as free speech and things like super PACs to fund political campaigns which is unconstitutional but you know I'm sort of digressing uh, but it, you know it is a shame that these corporations get huge contracts from these uh, from the city which is taxpayer dollars and just totally screw the pooch all the way around it's just ridiculous yeah I mean in, in all fairness the city of Plaquemine was a little bit greedy because they do make money off of water services and so they were they had they had abundant water supply for the community as it were with what they had but they decided to expand their services to a broader area and that was the reason they built the new um, ah, facility so it was there so, it was their greed all along that was the main well that's <laughs> that's a that's a harsh yeah. assessment but that's what happened that's what happened yeah and so now the village or the city is out 1.2 mil then the litigation starts and the team, the team that we had for the um, representing the city was from New Orleans, and for the contractor was a group out of Baton Rouge. And again, I think I said before, it was the clash of the egos, clash of the titan egos from a, from a lawyer standpoint. So you had the the guys from New Orleans that roll into town and. That was the only time I got taken out to dinner at Ruth Chris Steakhouse. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I was the stinky guy that came in from the field <laughs> smelling like dead fish and meet these guys because I didn't have enough time to go back to the hotel. Plaquemine was about 40 minutes drive from Baton Rouge. So the place I stayed for probably weeks at a time, some instances, the, uh, it was a truck stop, and back then they, I only hit, there was a, like a Shoney's and a Burger King and a McDonald's. And, and of course, I remember, of course, the main three food groups. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so one of the reasons I was used a lot by other people in our company was because I was such a cheap meal ticket, uh-huh. literally. And where I was staying, because there are no other restaurants, I went through the two Big Macs for lunch, two for dinner, morning two egg McMuffins, then two Big Macs at lunch. And ever since then, every time I eat a McDonald's, if I do at all, I get a, such a violent reaction to sodium, I puff up like a balloon. Yeah. Have, <laughs> so, have, you, ever, have you ever seen Super Size Me? Yeah. 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 Pretty, pretty and, bad uh, stuff there. Now, uh, just out of the curiosity, uh, so were you sort of a free agent at, at some point, like where the, you were basically uh, – you know, all expenses paid to do these travels, or was it, and then you were reimbursed, or just sort of how did that work logistically? You were working under a firm still at this point. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. You, I mean, no one's really a person without the letterhead. Right, so right. there are definitely names within the industry that could carry around their weight by their name alone, but that name had to be pretty much associated by a company under letterhead because kind of one needs the other and a company's not anything without good staff and a person's not anything good or they're going to be challenged if they don't have a good company representing them right so yep so i was i was fortunate because i just loved what i did i was terrible at office politics i couldn't stand it and the field was i learned infinitely more in the field just one listening to people and talking with other you know operations standpoint and contractors and i got i mean i just naturally got along with everyone and 
So <laughs> let all the people back in the office with the alphabets after their name and parading around thumping chess in meetings that, uh, again, for when I was down here, that I'd meet these guys in the office and I'd be clumping in there with the muck and shoes and stinking up the room. But it, you know, so, people got so, over it. So were you, uh, have you seen the film Aaron Brockovich? Yeah. Yeah, that was a pretty good pretty good film that uh really interested me because it showed um I mean at least from what it seemed it showed so Julia Roberts. Well, there's that. Yeah. Uh but it sort of showed how, you know, there's uh basically this whole corporate um uh I guess you could say worldview or uh corporate uh basically MO to just basically do whatever they need to do to, to meet their bottom line and to, uh, you know, show perpetual annual growth and have profits for their shareholders. And they just really don't give a damn what happens to the people in the middle, you know, in the middle of it. And in fact, they'll, they'll actually, um, do underhanded things to deny insurance claims because of the things that they did. And it's just, you know, it gets so, uh, repulsive, you know, at the bureaucratic levels of this. Um, so I, I do see what you're saying. It's uh, it's almost like Walt Disney. He loved to uh, take credit for you know all the great animations, but uh, he didn't do. He wasn't an artist, but he took credit for everyone's work as if it was his own. So, yeah, yeah. Anyways, so so when it got to the litigation stage and just kind of run through this, that told you about the first trial that went two weeks the the plaintiff side got up and presented their case and talked about the design the design firm they cashed out early they just wrote a check and said we're we're done and you guys can't come after us anymore because we signed off and they took a percentage of what the original claim was so if it's 20 percent of a million then you know they paid their two hundred thousand right yeah. So they're out of the picture. I believe that someone from the design firm did testify at one point, just indicating that there were issues. And so after the two weeks, the other side got up and said, hey, there's no case, and this is ridiculous. The judge said, hey, I agree, because no one really knows what's what's wrong and don't know why, so really no case. So that went to, that was a, it was a bench trial. And it went to the appellate court. The appellate court overturned the ruling, and it went back to another bench trial. So and I just I wonder if there was any sort of uh, conflict of interest with that original judge, like there was in that previous <laughs> no. case. Yeah, just because it paid for the, the contractor paid for the guy's election. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And it's just so crazy because how could uh, I mean this was obviously somebody. Uh, somebody's at fault here, and whether it's uh, a quality control thing or whether it's just at an engineering level or whether – I mean, who's, whose job is it to oversee that these sort of construction uh, you know, projects are done in such a way that it's not going to, you know, poison people well, or – there- yeah, there's checks and balances throughout the project, and for quality control, quality assurance, QAQC, there's – you know, on-site reps from the design for an on-site reps from the contractor and the village supplies their people to oversee it. That's what I was at Marathon was I was the on-site rep to basically document that things are going accordingly to specs and, and construction drawings. Right. So, you know, in this case here, the the oversight from the design firm was lax. The village was lax because they probably had someone that wasn't really that familiar with construction. And basically, the the construction was a piece of garbage. And but the emphasis I'm trying to say here is piece of garbage from a fact based standpoint is one thing. It's the the way it's described that gets into what the truth of the matter is. And, again, I was talking about how the poorly consolidated concrete, I couldn't say that because I was not qualified according to the the Louisiana law. That's ridiculous. But that I wasn't qualified as a... a Material as a, specialist or whatever. Right, yeah. so I was I was qualified as a fact-finding witness where I could talk um, quantitative evaluations of things, but I could not talk about qualitative 
things. So when it got into the water cement ratio from the mixes, they had high water cement ratios, and that led to a lot of cracking in the walls. And and because there was such a lot, so much water added to these mixes, then the shrinkage increased. And had there not been the added water, that the cracks most likely would have been. A, a smaller size, which would not have allowed water to penetrate through the walls. Again, it's it's from a qualitative stamp or a quantitative standpoint, it was X amount of gallons were added, water cement ratio exceeded that specified, and by the characteristics of concrete, that the increased water cement ratio increases the likelihood of shrinkage cracks. And now yeah, that's, cool. that's sort of odd because you know I've actually worked on concrete in, in several different ways over my lifetime, and you know I, I understand that you've got to get the mix right, but on a project like that, that's a pretty pretty uh, big project as far as I understand it, and so that's a very much uh, boots on the ground quality wow. control issue. Now I'm just wondering if it had something to do with maybe you know unusually high um, humidity levels. Uh, or was it, you know, was the construction done during the winter so the concrete didn't, you know, set up properly? I don't know. Yeah, you can turn anything into a PhD project, and, right. you know, breaking it down, and, and it's just size that gets into it, whether it's, you know, 20 truckloads to, to do a wall section or 200 truckloads to do a dam section. It's, you know, again, it's gets back to... The, the magnitude of the project. Right, but uh, what this, I'm saying is if you've got a bad mix in one spot of that, that's one thing, but if you've got a bad mix all the way across it, you know, that, that shows that uh, it could even be this third-party contractor who does the local uh, concrete delivery that was at fault, <laughs> right? I mean, that's that's how far this sort of thing could go, I guess, if you're really splitting hairs, right? Well, to, to kind of wrap this up, showing how they're all intertwined between construction, design, and materials, if I'm the designer and I spec a 3,000-pound mix with a water cement ratio of 0.4 to 0.45, and, and, but I don't add any provisions for air entrainment, then I wrote a bad spec for the design of the concrete. So it's hard to fault the contractor if that was the issue. If he that was following the specs. If he was following the specs. Right. Now, if the designer spec the right concrete for the conditions, then um, when the, the contractor's running the site, he sees the truck that's been sitting on the sun for two hours, and, and the stuff co starts coming out of the, the chutes, like molasses, right. and decides, well, I'll throw in a couple cans of Coke because that slicks down the mix or add fi 50 gallons of water to get uh, the flowability better. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, but the thing is, these knuckleheads, they went and they documented how much water they added. So it made it pretty easy. Oh, so that's actually what they did then. They were basically... So they were, right, but we had material samples from the project, and through the Petri... It's, called a petrographic examination that they, under microscope in a laboratory setting, that they can determine and, and scientifically, I hate that word, but scientifically come up and make their assessments of the concrete. And they can, they can project what the, the estimated water cement ratio was. Now, granted, that's, that's opinion based because from my understanding when they determine a water cement ratio they just really look at the color of the paste and the lighter the color the more water that's added typically so again so it's that sort of like a like a litmus test almost yeah, I mean, again, it gets down to a microscopic level, but even the microscopic level indicates a quantitative assessment. That quantitative assessment is based on a qualitative uh, review. So, right. again, this is the semantics of litigation. That's red, yeah, and, red tape for you. Well, it's red tape, but it's really fine-tuning when you talk. You better... 
be careful with what you talk about. And I guess that's why I started, you know, from the sideline, watching all this flat earth stuff going on, that people coming out of the woodwork just making bold claims with no foundation, and, right. and it's all opinions, and then people get all excited about opinions, and the, you know, everyone starts losing their mind before it's like, hey, guys, wake up. It's the earth. It's what you see. It's not opinion-based. Your observations are facts. So it just gets ludicrous after a while that, oh, my gosh. But Well, you I know, the, other, the, the other thing, too, is, though, I think that we have to be careful because it seems like a lot of the times our observations here on the ground are not necessarily good uh, indicators of what's going on up in the sky, for example. Um, it's well, a, it gets back to do you believe yourself or do you believe other people and and if i want to convince people i saw this and and you're a person that wants other people to think for you then you're going to get what you what you do so right well i guess uh, like for an example uh there was or what you don't do there was a thing going around for a while that rainbows prove that there's a dome in the sky and um you know a a rainbow can be caused by a uh uh what's the word i'm looking for refractor basically a prism or it can be caused not necessarily by two mirrors but two um, electromagnetic fields or two sides of an electromagnetic field and so there was this you know big thing going around that rainbows prove you know, not only the flat earth, but the dome. And um, I, I just think that we can only take our observations at face value a lot of the times. And if there's any, if there's leaps in logic saying, okay, we see this, therefore, you know, we see ABC, therefore XYZ, well, what about DEF, you know, HIJKLMNOP, what about everything in between? And, and so that's sort of, you know, the way that I try to approach all this anymore is because it really is easy to, to, to get excited about something and just sort of uh, run with it and then realize, well, wait a minute, you know, maybe maybe I should have, uh, you know, stated that a little bit differently, but, you know, we're only human. But no, I mean, talking about the, with the rainbows and things, Jesse started off on a thing and I really liked the way he was presenting Jesse, it because... Now, Jesse? Jesse Spots. Okay, and I've I've heard the name, and I've never honestly I don't think I've ever seen any of his stuff. Uh, but I heard uh, people threatening and talking bad stuff about him, so I don't know anything no, about I, him. I really like him because he kind of just lays it out there. But he we may have is, had him on our show too, so forgive me if that's the case. I may know him, and I'm just bad with names. I remember faces much better than names, so forgive me if I do know you, Jesse, and I just said that I don't know you, but I'm just really bad with names. But it's just, uh, it seems like the first time I heard the name was uh, when that guy, uh, Je- what's his name, Jeff Stewart, was saying that he's going to out a shill, I think. I don't know, but what the hell do I know? Oh, who cares? Good Lord, no, people. I'm just trying to figure out who is uh, Jesse Spot. Oh. So, na- so now oh. it's like you have to uh, to at least like give me one example of something that he did that I might might have seen. That doesn't matter though. I will digress at this point. Uh, you know what? This is funny because I use the old Google Earth to to lay out these locations and then use the file and applied it to what you gave me yesterday. This. I was going, the only reason I was showing this is because I had to walk the silly bridge every day three times because we were taking solar data as the sun beat. This was, I'm backing up, this is the Wando River Bridge outside, hey, your neck of the woods, South Carolina, okay. outside of Charleston. Okay. And this was touted as a jointless bridge. So our project was we were out there to assess the joints that were failing. <laughs> okay, now wait a minute. So, a jointless bridge. Now, I know. What it, now does that entail that it doesn't have any of the sort of uh, large structures jutting up and you know, like the uh, tension cables and things like that? Is that what they mean by jointless? No, the the jointless bridge is kind of a, a misnomer that for again with a large structure like this you have to put in joints to allow for the thermodynamics of the materials primarily the the concrete so we're as, talking about expanding and contracting due to heat and cold okay right and the reason they call this a jointless bridge is instead of having joints on on a very smaller small center 
say, 20, 30 feet is they had, again, rusty memory, maybe 600, 800 feet between joints. So when they caught jointless bridge, like here's one, and here's one, and again. But the reason I wanted to show this was in the other Google Earth, here's one, that, I mean, I literally saw concrete, and you could see the core holes that we took from this this image. Uh, in this version, you, I mean, you see what you see. But um, so I had to walk this and take the solar solar temperature data during the day and show how much the joints opened and closed as the temperature beat down on it during the day and cooled off at night. And I forgot what the total distance was, maybe three miles. And so I was the little knucklehead that, with the hard hat that walked along here and, and took all the, the visuals and temperature recordings. Well, back then, this was such a huge issue because all the joints were failing, and they had to slow down from what the speed limit was, 55, 70, whatever, to a snail pace because the joints were so torn up that the tire damage was Hell, so bad. Hell, I'd find another bridge. That's how, that's how slow I'd go across it. Yeah. And the joints so are again, and, and you know, a lot, I think it's an important point to make too. A lot of people don't understand or don't uh, really fully grasp uh, the amount of uh, expanding and contracting that can happen due to uh, changes in temperature, and that's essentially thermodynamics. And when you look at when you oh, look right. at things like the ISS, which are supposedly in the thermosphere, from day to night it's going like positive some hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit to nighttime when it's some negative degrees. I could look up the numbers, but whatever. It's just ridiculous flux in temperature from day to night. And uh, apparently, you know, NASA would have had to solve all these engineering problems that, you know, nobody really has an answer for. And yet uh, there's the ISS, you know, up there all the time. And so, you know, where are all these uh, uh, wonderful inventions and problem solvings of uh, engineers that must have occurred in order for the ISS to be doing what they say it does? And we just don't see it. Um, and I think think that applications for things like the, the joints and bridges would be a perfect thing for this material that NASA has invented that doesn't have any sort of, uh, you know, changes in uh, expansion and contraction due to thermal dynamics. So, you know, shame on NASA for keeping that from the engineers of the world. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say, and you said it, so you beat me. But So, again, so when this was occurring – that it was down to one lane, and I was out there, and so I learned how people react to to the people who want to have their frustration taken out on. And so down here at the time, I'd say one out of three vehicles that went by was a pickup truck with a bass boat in the back, and all these guys were out trying to get to their fishing hole, and when they saw a little knucklehead with a hard hat on, decided that that was the cause of all the problems, so they would throw things at that oh, yeah. person who happened to be me, so I had shoes and apple cores and things like that, and lots of nice comments that uh, as I was walking along here. Well, it's, it's, and it's, it's nice to know when you're appreciated. Oh, it, there was love. It just came out different. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's just, I love you through this apple core. Wow. And this sh that was another thing that you kind of wonder is, when you see a shoe or a sock on the side of the road, it's, it got there somehow, and you just wish it had a way to tell a yeah, story. Yeah, there, there must have been but, some civil engineer out there. Um uh, And, and, and I so uh, now on this project with the... Uh, with these seams, or uh, I guess, what did you call them? You said joints. joints. Uh, uh, what was the end uh, result? Did they have to uh, change some of the specifications, or I I don't know because they had to be torn out. And again, it was a think of a three-way 
reacting joint that you had not only in and out of the joint as the, the bridge expanded this way, it had the up and down with the dynamics of as the vehicles went across. So as you had this thing that was supposed to work in an XY taking on a Z component, a vertical component, it just tore them up. So it was a bad design from so the they, get-go. So they got rid of and the bridge altogether or they just re... No, 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 no. They got rid of the joint okay, system. Okay. So it get it's a brand new facility, but if the joints don't work, then you know, even though it's touted as the jointless bridge, if you so they had issues with it almost immediately after construction. Oh, immediately. Oh, immediately. Wow. Immediately. And so, what were the cars like? Hit like going up and down bumps the whole way over the bridge, or? Oh, it, uh, the, what happened, again, I'm going by rusty memory, is that the DOT started getting slammed by all these claims against them because people were, I mean, flat tire was probably uh, the least of the issue and, and axle damage and, and tires getting shredded. The, yeah. I remember there were a lot of pretty bad stories of the damage, so that's why the DOT the DOT had to shut it down or Probably slow a lot down of the wrecks, traffic. You imagine because you know a lot of people don't realize, but if you're going down the highway at 65 miles an hour and you hit a you hit a little right. dip and then overcorrect, you're going off that bridge. And um, real quick, I'm going to go refill on coffee, so if you can uh, just hang tight and uh, you can continue talking if you want, or just take me a second to refill up on the yeah, coffee. Yeah, I'm going to refill too, okay, so I'll take five. Go for All right, I'm back. I don't know if you are. Nope. Well, I was wanting to play my video game a little bit tonight. I'm, let me just get back to work, to work now, please. Hello, hello. All right, hello, sorry hello. about that. My my wife's oh, wanting me to watch everything that she watches, and I'm like, no, I'm playing my video game tonight when we get done. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, I did big screen. Man, TV. I love this. I love this <laughs> monitor. It's awesome because, like, again, I told you I have to sit. Yeah. I don't know, maybe ten feet back um, if I want to rest my back, and I can just I can see everything. It is so great. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. And, well, no, it's really good on my. I think it was probably hurting my back and hurting my eyes without it. So yeah, I think it, I'd I'd probably uh, classify this as a uh, health benefit device. <laughs> yep. There you go. Oh, and by the way, I, I figured out the whole HDMI thing. All you have to do is uh, shut your computer down, turn the TV off, and then set it to uh, plug your HDMI cable in to one or whichever one. And then turn the computer on, and oh no! Then turn the TV to HDMI input one. Then turn the computer on, and then it booted up just fine. So there you go. Yep. Right. I knew it was straightforward and again juggling, juggling which thing you turn on first. Yep, that was all so. So again, from a public standpoint, that they built this new bridge, which was hundreds of millions. Dollars, I'm, I'm sure, and once it was open, it relieved the stress of the traffic in the adjacent area, but once it began being used, it started falling apart, 
So now you had a brand new thing that's falling apart, and people tend to get upset. And I know fishermen with bass boats um, show their love differently, but um, and this went on for years. I mean, it was no one's going to do anything until someone starts paying the bill. So the DOT trying to um, appease everyone has this um, massive, expensive project that isn't being used is going to take all the the political hit. And but from the designer or the expansion joint manufacturer. They're like, I, you know, come up with a number and we'll pay you for what we did and what we provided. And even if it's a bad, bad uh, design, then our our liability is limited. Right. So I don't, I never know what happened to it. They had to replace all the joints. That's for sure. But who paid for it? I have no idea. But uh, the again, this this I, went I think on a lot to, of this, honestly, and this is just my opinion, but and maybe maybe you've seen evidence for this or the contrary. But my opinion is there's a lot of cronyism going on in the uh, you know the local uh, level governments to where um, you've got contractors who are basically um, you, you know you've got this cronyism, you've got these conflicts of interest where contractors are given basically either no bid or basically guaranteed contracts, and they may be they may not be the best qualified for that job but they're you know they got a brother of a cousin who's a senator and so they get that contract and you know you see this very thing even with the Iraq war you've got um, private contractors going overseas to Afghanistan to do the soldiers laundry for something like 50 billion uh, 50 million dollars a month or something crazy like that um, and th- those are all no bid contracts, and so I personally think that it's this cronyism. And look at that beautiful plane, <laughs> but uh, I-, I think it's hmm. this cronyism and this sort of uh, you know, I guess you could say insider uh-huh. dealing that's that's leaving us with a lot of these problems that that you've run into with civil engineering projects and things like that. Anyway, just my two cents. Well, dumb people kept us in business, and there's certainly a not a shortage of dumb people doing dumb things. And this was a project where I had a bad reputation for, for a lot of reasons, but one of them was I'd go to a job site and hire to look at one thing, and I would see other things, and and bring that to the attention of people. It's like a doctor that I made a house visit, and while I was looking at a guy's broken leg, I realized, wait a minute, you guys might have cancer over here. And this was a perfect example. This is a huge pyramid structure, and this is a capstone. Again, different perspective now, uh, 20 years after the fact of what this structure really is. It's a basically a big pyramid yeah. and enter your your opinion now there. this is a, but, this is a google earth view now is that thing pr- pretty tall or is this is it actually a pretty flat pretty low profile thing that we're looking at i believe it was six or eight stories high so it's 80 maybe i'm trying to get a, a ground that's guy fine. that's fine let me get, let me get this guy because they'll definitely show it Come on. Yeah, it's hard to on, it's hard guy. to tell um from the sort of uh one you know, two D view. But that's okay. I was just, just curious because uh Well it's it's little well, where's the photos? Let me get up. Okay, yeah. so there we go. So it we doesn't... can sort of get an idea of the scale there just from that one side of it. Okay. That's... Wow, okay, so that that thing's pretty damn tall then. Yeah, it's it's a... Yeah, there we go. go. Wow. Yeah, that was big. So when I came out here, they had the just the raw framing starting to uh, get, get erected, and I just noticed some horrific cracking going on at these... These beams. Okay. Now, are those and steel beams? Or? No, these are concrete. No, these concrete are concrete. Beams, okay. Concrete. Yeah, there's 
Yeah, there's probably better way to like describe it. Probably but reinforced concrete, I would say. Well, it's re- yeah, it's reinforced concrete, but there's it's concrete framing, so you had all these lines or the the load bearing from the other floors came down into this ridge beam and carrying all the loads down this this sure. path. And there's a little arch here, and this whole area was just getting torn up with with just the framing being erected. So I pointed that out to not only our client, or I mean back uh, to our manager and things that word got to the to the client, and they're saying, "Well, what about that?" And and uh, Again, I was out there to look at something else. I can't remember so what the original. So basically, they told you you should have kept your mouth shut, that sort of thing. I should have kept my oh mouth my shut. God. And what happened was this turned into a PhD project because the design was so bad, and the I forgot who the designer was, but he was a big concrete guy, and I, I want to say. Uh, Bertrand Goldberg, this is a Bertrand Goldberg design, and he did the concrete, they look like moon. You ever see those concrete buildings that look like moon bases? They've got the oval windows. I think I have. I think I have. I've, I've sort of always been an, an, an admirer of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's work, and so he's probably, yeah. you know, I, I tend to gauge any architects or engineers based off of, you know, his type of stuff, and, and I do seem to remember the name that you mentioned, so. Um. But, I, again, I, I was on a Bertrand Goldberg project and actually was in the same trailer with him, and, and again, he's he's very well known by his his trade and architectural style, but he's solely concrete. Yeah, and you know that's and funny. What and not to interrupt, but I just think it's uh, to me. I, I think that building with concrete as load bearing and as a structural thing is just sort of outdated. I mean, it, it just seems to me like steel would be a much more. Um, hey, 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 hey! <laughs> I know hey, you're. A, I was a cement. I know. For, I know. That, that put dinner on the but do you, table. But doesn't it, does, does it make sense because concrete does have the, you know, the ability whether, you know, because I've even worked on swimming pools and stuff, and over time, you know, it does chip away, and, and chips can turn into cracks, and cracks can turn into some, you know, much worse problems, whereas steel, eh, you don't, you don't have so many problems like that. Well, I'm sure cost is is the primary issue, but from a concrete standpoint, it's probably the most common practice that has the biggest avenue to allow for human error to to change yeah, things yeah. because it's got so many different things, and it's it's a simple concept, but laying reinforcement is difficult, providing the right concrete cover is a challenge, and getting the materials, and so it's a lot of elements with a lot of variables that bad things can occur and affect the original, what the original intent is. Steel is a little bit more cut and dry that you have a spec for for a certain type of steel, and that's fairly straightforward from the mill certs from the steel supplier. Well, the only problem and with steel is, though, is that it melts under uh, jet fuel fire, so, you know. Yeah, that's, but it's only... Only on 9-11 uh, and only in the Twin Towers, yeah, only in New York. Yeah, <laughs> and I think they stopped that. They stopped that. So yeah, that was one weird. Time th- one time thing. But, yeah. Well, happened. <laughs> and so this was one of those that starts that started off with a broken finger, and it turned out to be a cancer. And the revenue gener- it was I think when I went out there is to take a core sample of the concrete, and I think that's what it was was. I was to take a core sample from these beams, ridge beams, and when I was taking the sample, it's like I can't even get a solid piece of of uh, concrete because there's so much reinforcement. And again, I now I'm 
trying to or recollecting a little things and the the well, rust it's, is it's, it's funny because apart. you know there's some similarities between you and I and and that is like sort of how you got in trouble for you know going out to the job site for one thing and seeing a huge problem and you know just doing your due diligence and having you know a good character and a good eye and and you you know what you're doing um you pointed out this other thing that was a bigger problem it was a, this is a huge problem and so i've sort of gotten myself into trouble in the past with clients by you know being hired to do one specific thing and usually it's you know I, my business was mainly around sales and marketing so there was graphic design aspects there was direct sales like talking with p- uh, potential customers there was training i mean every you name it uh, uh customer relations management software um uh, automation and setting that sort of thing up. So full spectrum. And, um, you know, I got uh, a lot of experience with that over the years. And, you know, sometimes because uh, I had a lot of clients sort of come and go for small projects and sometimes they'd hire me on to do something and I'd say, you know, I can do this, that, and the other, that's fine. But, you know, one thing I would just recommend, you know, I'm looking at this over here. Um, this is a huge problem and, you know, I, you might want to focus on that. Now, a lot of times that's very well received and people appreciate that sort of thing. But a lot of times people are very sort of set in their ways and they'd rather just have you, you know, keep your blinders on, don't, you know, don't stray out outside and you know who knows you could have saved lives from just pointing out that little issue so anyway just thought it was an interesting sort of parallel yeah it's it's, that's a it was one of those that had they continued the construction and done nothing there absolutely i would can i prove it uh i don't know but absolutely the design was so under designed that there would have been a well, collapse I, I think you should have and i don't I, think any there'd be very well, i was just going to say uh, i think you should have gotten a raise but that's just me oh yeah, right <laughs> it's no it's like why don't you just pay attention to what you're supposed to do and not do all these yeah. other things but uh this was another example where i went down this was in puerto rico and on the island, we were little gringos, and so we flew into San Juan. The fabrication yard for all these beams were around here, and the construction project was down here. They're putting in a brand new roadway with all these uh, prefabricated bridge deck beams. And when I went to the prefab yard, that they had all these problems with the the cracks developing before they were even erected. And while I was on the top of these beams looking at them, noticed uh, some issues, and that became the focus of a bigger project. But, again, it was, why why don't you just go down there and do what you're supposed to do, and it turned into a big, bigger thing. But, But, again... Um, but see, that's that, I, I'm having, the same way though. I really am, and it's almost like to a fault. But um, you know, if you see something that uh, that you know is wrong, or that you know is going to be an issue, or that you you know you have the experience to say, hey, that's going to be an issue down the road, or potentially, you know, right. you, you should just call it out. I mean, I'm the same way. But yeah, some people don't appreciate that when, in the long run, you know, by just being diligent and just you know an ounce of caution an ounce of safety an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of uh repair you know what i mean so anyway. yeah well again i i could care less i'm going to i'm going to jump up and down if i see a problem i'm going to say it if they take you know taking criticism for for what i did i could care less it's you know a bigger issue again that gets into the politics where you know, you have you have the people that are addressing the political side of things from a scope of work, and that was the the thing that I always wandered outside the lines of is what the original scope of work was. But I can't tell my eyes to stop looking at other things when I go to a That's job right. site. So when when you see cracks or problems going on, it's that there's a problem. And just because my eyes were only supposed to look at one thing and they see something else, that's I'll let the office worry about that. But again, I'm not trying to beat up on the office because they probably were fearful at times. Thing, you know, I'm going to go out there and find all these things and start jumping up and down when I probably shouldn't have. And I, I agree. I probably did that a little bit more than I should have. And and uh got myself into areas that were none of my business but 
Um, it is what well, it is. you know, it seems to me that, you know, and I don't know, this is just probably a very biased um, observation, but it seems to me it, it's the yes men, it's the one that will just do what they're told, just do their job to the letter, and not, you know, stray outside of that. It's usually those types of, um, you know, archetypes that end up getting promoted throughout the corporate world anyway, because, you know, they're not any sort of liability, they're not considered to be, you, you know, and, and personally, I'd, I'd much rather have someone that's going to be honest than to just agree with me and do exactly as they're told. That's just me. You, you know what I mean? Well, I, it, it wasn't an issue of honest, it was an issue of scope of work and liability. Right, but what I'm saying is, is, is if you would have noticed something like that and not said anything, then yeah, you would have been being dishonest, but it seems to me that they were almost training you well, or, you know, I don't know, whipping you is probably a harsh word for being honest. No, no, yeah, don't, I don't like that. <laughs> but do you see That's, what I'm saying? I mean, no. I don't know, to me, you know, it, it would seem like if I saw an issue with a client's project that I didn't say, hey, this is an issue, then, you know, to me, that's being, I would feel like I was being dishonest. But anyway, it, it, I don't know. That's just me. <laughs> Anyway, so the just I and again I could spend lots of time discussing all the different projects that were worked on and and every time I I try to break this out by the state and what projects were in the state, but what started really kicking memory was uh, when I started thinking about garages. It's just this horde of. Garages, I forgot all now, about. When you, now, when you so say like, garages, we're not talking about a two-car garage. We're talking like, uh, I remember one time I worked on a garage that was, uh, what was, I'm trying to think of what it was, 900,000 square feet. So I don't know if that's any gauge of uh, the sort of project that you're talking about in terms of a garage. That's big. Yeah. That's yeah. big. Yeah, that's that's an airport size type. Um <laughs> There's one person on the planet that will know this project, but one of the one of the first projects I had at CTL was the Heckenbach Garage in Skokie, and it was a homeowner that paid a contractor to pour his garage slab, and he was so animate about going after the contractor called us off and said, can you come out here and take a core sample and, and determine if this concrete's good or not? And we're like, yeah, we can, and it's not going to be cheap. And he said, I don't care. So we went out there, took core samples, did material testing, and I, the invoice was around three grand. So I think right there almost exceeded the cost of the construction. Wow. But so the Heckenbach garage, he went after the contractor because uh, the concrete was starting to crack up. And now, so and from a litigation and, standpoint, though, if the contractor was to be found, you know, at fault there, then he would have to pay not only for the reparations, but also for, he'd have to cover your costs as well, wouldn't he? Or his insurance? No, the well, the, it depends on the lawsuit that the the homeowner would would file if he felt like, hey, I had to prove that the the work was erroneous or not as specified. And I think that through punitive damages that he should pay for the cost that I bore, I bear. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I are engineer. <laughs> um, <laughs> that uh, you know, if I if I exhausted these costs to prove my point and put them down as punitive claims, and the judge says I agree, then right. yeah. But, you know, I don't know. But here's some other garages. Um, but, again, I, I started thinking of the garages that it started with, like, 20, 25. But, you know, the grand scheme of things, I looked at concrete, and hundreds of structures of concrete, and concrete doesn't know what it is. It just, you know, whether it's in, in a dam or a bridge or a pipeline or anything else, that uh, concrete does what concrete does. This was a parking garage. I think this was a parking garage because it's got a. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! 
anyway. Maybe the one I maybe the one I was uh, thinking of that I did some concrete work on many moons ago was a hundred thousand square feet. It was pretty damn big though. Nine hundred thousand square feet sounds a little off now. Maybe it was a hundred thousand, which is still pretty damn big. Yeah. Yeah. This was the parking garage. <laughs> it was like a place pointing at a shed or something. But yeah, this is a little parking garage and they had the joints here. Again, the, the angle itself would cause issues or design provisions to a designer would have to really focus in on to make sure there's adequate reinforcement in these areas. And when the expansion and contraction occurs, just but material itself has expansion and contraction then in the uh, elements that it has has you know through temperature changes that concrete does what it does and it expands and contracts so if these joints are under design for reinforcement then they start getting torn up and the design the shape of itself does allows for asymmetric expansion and contraction so these things were getting torn up pretty well plus they had uh, aluminum electric lines in the embedded in the concrete which creates a cell and corrosion process of the reinforcement kicks in and so you get damage getting uh, accelerated because of that but so um and just sort of, and I guess this is sort of probably backtracking a little bit. Um, when your, what was your major uh, field of study when you were going to college again, uh, or specific uh, major if you had one when you went in? Civil engineering. Civil engineering. Civil engineering. And did you take? Did you have some right. physics courses? Obviously, some math courses that are sort of, um, you know, prerequisites or. Yeah, the first two years of any engineering curriculum requires abundant math. So you have your math background. And my concentrated area in civil engineering was structures. Other avenues were be maybe environmental or hydraulic um, aspects, transportation. Again, these are different divisions of civil engineering, but I, I chose the structural side. So our basic background was the design, steel design, concrete design, materials background, lab work for, for materials. And then you get into the detailed design aspects with the matrix analysis of structural design. And so you get into the number crunching side, which, again, I was absolutely terrible with because it's a precision field, and I wish I were a better precision person, but I could take a number and run with it, and and I wasn't able to get a good perspective of of how crazy, you know, it'd be one of those where, hey, I was supposed to divide feet by inches, and so I had a factor of 12 that I carried through the calculations, and, and all of a sudden I'm supposed to get reinforcement placed every three inches with number 18 bars, and that's what the numbers showed, and it's like, I can't help it. I forgot to divide by 12 and the calc, right. but I was not a calc person but but again it was the field where I learned what um, those numbers meant so in the classroom you design concrete and you're supposed to have a water cement ratio of 0.45 and you design the mix it wasn't until I got on the field to realize how little or or how large amount of water has an effect on the water cement ratio in concrete then you've got massive pours and maybe tr 10 trucks or, you know, 50 trucks coming to a job site. And whether it's, you know, 10 below zero or 85 degrees out, that all the factors that incorporate there, you've got all the admixtures, the, the ready mix plant, that you've got air entrainment that's put in, and it's, it's designed that there's so many. There's so many rotations of the drum as it's going down the highway and determined that 
Maybe you need 45 revelations for the air entrainment to get mixed in, and if it gets to the job site and has to sit around for 45 minutes or a couple hours, then you've got over-rotated concrete, which affects the air entrainment, and then that goes into the concrete, and so you've got isolated pockets of poor entrainment, and do 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 that again all these things come up so when you're in the office doing your design work from point a to point b there's you know a lot of things well, can happen you know i'm i'm sort of so. the same way where you know if you can teach me something you know with the mathematics and i'll understand it but it's not until i actually apply it and use it in a real world sense that i you that i really fully have learned or feel that i've learned something you know I, I i feel like understanding something you know mathematically is one thing but actually applying it to reality and and having it work in reality and seeing where things can go wrong and that's that's where you actually learn is in the field with the boots on the ground so yeah i'm with you, with you there right. and um and we can definitely go over a couple of more of these because it's very interesting. But um, it, eventually what I want to do is uh, just sort of segue into either the segment that you wanted to talk about or um, segue into how you, as a, you know, obviously a, a very successful and a long-term career engineer, became a, became a crazy flat earther. Uh, <laughs> <nah>. <laughs> um, the segment... Kind of what I want to get into is what happened was I started at CTL in 88 after I got done at Michigan. And the side story was, hold on a second, um, because I had the concentration of field work, it was a perfect fit. That I was an engineer that didn't always need a technician to go along because I'd be the one that would do the core samples and, and testing. So I was kind of independent from that standpoint. So it saved a lot of money on budgets for these projects because you wouldn't have to double up on airfare and meals. Sure. So they got two, they got two for the price of one. Yeah, that's a simple way to say it, but it was definitely a benefit at times that I would I would uh, kind of be all in one package. Yeah. So this is just a, a gist of a portion of, of my field background. So concurrent with all this was, oh, I'll go over this real quick. So I was in the oil industry for a little bit. Yeah, right out of undergraduate. undergraduate. And, and by oil industry, uh, we're talking offshore rig type of stuff, or yeah, yeah. So this is kind of I don't want to make it real personal, but the the background element to these things. This was my first design project where they were lifting this whole structure. And they had to beef up these eye rings for the lifting. And so this was my little, little thing that said, well, you need to put these on there in order to have these pad eyes capable of the lift. And this was the, the marathon private plane during a, they did a abandonment of a structure and then towed it over to offshore Alabama. And at the time, it was the only the second artificial reef to go up in the Gulf of Mexico. I spent two weeks on a on a tugboat hauling this steel frame from offshore Texas to Alabama, and I was a little bit um, woozy from the diesel because engineers weren't really. Uh, great provided great accommodations on the tugboat, but um, <laughs> is that this was my boss was Jake, and Jake was an old good old Texan boy, and Jake liked uh, his hunting and fishing, and and I became the guy who I didn't do this, but I had the reputation of hey, we know who did that, and. Um, 
which is I want to lead to other things. But so here's Jake. Um, there's a million stories on this trip, but this was the the project that I oversaw, and they were taking out an old structure, this guy, and putting in. Believe it or not, this is a new structure. Exactly the same. <laughs> Yeah, right. So this was what they called a well protector, and then this was going to be a production platform. It had a drill rig and and capability of of not only drilling but also production. Um, this is just a little dramatic of being offshore during storms and stuff. Again, I could exhaust way too much time talking about this stuff. But uh, so again, this is what a, a darky guy from school does when they get out and and has the who is this neat? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was that one of the air tanks that they put on the the structure that they towed over to Alabama on on uh, for an artificial reef. Okay, so, that's one big ass air tank. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Well, again, I uh, they're so really good stories that aren't appropriate for now, but um, funny project. So again, just those. So those pad eyes that I designed. This wasn't the actual structure that they were. You were. You saw. Boy, I are an engineer. Uh-huh. Those those weren't the ones uh, for this structure. But that's what those pad eyes were for, was for a lift like this. So that's why they had to be strong enough, obviously. Yeah. And, um, so that, so that great whole thing structure about, is hoisted up by those four, I guess, what are those, steel cables? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That is pretty amazing. So for that, yeah, so that's one of four pad eyes that are used okay. for the lift. So... So the the little not secret, but the the design concept is when in doubt make it stout, and uh, pad eyes by design, I believe are a safety factor of four. So if it says half an inch, then you go, well, it's going to be yeah. two inches. Yeah, that's and that's something that I think so important is that you always want to over engineer for safety. Um, if if your mathematics says it needs to be you know so strong or so thick then, yeah, you want to double it or triple it or even quadruple it to be on the safe side, right? It's better to err on the side of caution. And yet you'll see NASA footage where they've got literally a rocket taking off with the shuttle attached by one bolt and one strut. And if you think about the inertia involved with a rocket taking off, it would take off and leave the shuttle on the ground with one bolt and one strut holding it together. It's just so ridiculous. Right. So, yeah. So, so this was me when I first went offshore, and I'm doing the metallurgical assessment of the weld. And by the end of the project, you get so worn out that this no, I'm kidding. <laughs> this was a NDP. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say you you weren't lying about all the Big Macs and McDonald's burgers. No, I'm kidding. I'm totally joking. <laughs> so this is two dollar Big Macs will do it for you, and then uh, then you get worn out by getting beat up. This is the the worst Waldo. Where's the, yeah? There you go. Well, yeah. Where's Waldo? And this is where we had to remove the old structure and use copper shot. And so I learned about copper shop and primacord and explosives and and uh, this was not what was supposed to happen. <laughs> so again, another story. And again, these are just the design people that were overseeing the design standpoint of things. Um, again, more personalities offshore. Um, this was our our steel inspector and the NDD guy for the welds. And one of the barges had a swimming pool on it, so so we were doing assessment of the the uh, walls on that one, and uh, just being that guy. Now this is a little segment. Remember, I was talking about the how our our Jake liked the clean office, and mine looked like a bad dorm room 
Um, well, that's that means you're working hard, and I'll tell you, um, when when I when I'm working and I've got a lot of different things, especially before computers, of course, and hell, even with computers, I, I everything is misplaced exactly where I know where it is. <laughs> right, and so this was this was construed as. Not being good. <laughs> oh, I can tell. I can tell you were busy at least, so that's good. And the thing was, had I not had this, and not this, and not this, and not this, and not this here, then and a clean desk, then I would have been well received. But because I was busy, so I would stay late. Because Jake would walk down the hallway at 3.59 or 4.01, somewhere <laughs> around then, and turn off everyone's lights. And basically, he was wrapping up his little shop at the end of the day. And he'd look inside the room and see me there with all this mess. And so he, oh, he didn't like me. And uh, wow. so I certainly reputation you know, why, and, and this, what i don't uh, understand is, is it so often is that people that are so for lack of a better word anal retentive always end up being in the management positions isn't that ain't it the truth <laughs> yeah so the yeah. reason i'm showing so this is because this i had a halloween party and this guy dressed up as oh, me <laughs> <laughs> so um Using him as the example is this was my corporate attire, and um, uh, yeah, this is Jim Saunders, and he was an interesting character. But um, so that was the reputation I had was the corduroy jeans and and knit tie, and that was this was what we were supposed to look like, and not everyone did. So again, my office looks like a dorm room. WCC well, it's almost like they should have given you two offices. They should have given you an office to have, you know, clean and presentable and meet with, you know, clients or whatever, and then have an office where you actually do your work. Because I totally, you know, no, I definitely understand where, you know, especially if you're working on multiple things, um, even, in, like I said, even with a computer. Um, if I had to close out every window that I was, when I was working on a project, I'd never get anything done. I keep stuff open and leave it open and leave it bookmarked, you know, whatever. That's... That's just how we roll, man. That's crazy. Right. So this was a, the first project I worked on at CTL was this uh, Robert Moses Parkway Dam outside of Niagara Falls. And this was internal. And this is where there's delaminations in the concrete. So mark that up and take photographs and document the findings. Um this would be typical for the delaminations, and then cracks would be spray painted. And so I was essentially being paid to do graffiti <laughs> out in the right. field. And my side interest would, and I'll get to why, but uh, I had quite a bit of downtime, and I'll get to that in a second. But one of the things I did while I was down was. This project was a litigation to show the congestion of reinforcement, and this was a dam structure for an inlet. And what I did was to model all the reinforcement that went in that I built. This is just regular electrical water, electrical wire, and took the design drawings and laid out all this reinforcement to show that when they cast the concrete, they had huge pockets that no concrete got to. So it was, I never knew what happened to this, but no one could really grasp what, you know, you could see the design drawings, but you don't really get a grasp of how congested it was. And that's what I used this So that for, was like so. a 3D model, and I guess this was before the luxury of something like AutoCAD. Yeah. Right. And, again, this this is where I just absolutely fell in love with what I did and was given the opportunity to do these little things. Um, and so wrapping up, what, 13 years, 
working at CTL. This, these were my boots, and uh, again, that well, that's that's unbecoming of an engineer if I've ever seen it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was my dog typo that, that kind of nod there and then this was working on the the Lugard Altus job that open canal liner where we had to be on our heels on the side of a, or in the, the the slope portion of the canal doing the documentation for three three and a half miles and so the boots were worn and not to play a uh, uh, big aspect but this was me i was this guy the goofball and everything else and not to play a lot on this but you know everyone's a character and that was my character and concurrent with all this was an issue it started I had bad knees since forever, yeah. and the long and short of it is, before I was even 25, I had eight knee surgeries, and six of those were total reconstruction. So during all the field work, that the body started wearing down, and... Over the years, um, I started getting taken out by multiple surgeries in the same year, and in the 90s, my back started going out, and again, going back to the personality that this this was me. Again, just this is where you're going to have to come back and chop this up because I'm getting out of order. No, you're, you're no, you're fine, and um, one thing, um, if I could possibly uh, steer this in, in some sort of way, because we're at an hour 23 minutes, and I want to try to keep it to two Ooh. hours, if, or as close to two hours as we can for this segment. Okay. Um, do you want to talk, and maybe I'll I'll talk a little bit about how I uh, came across the flat earth, and you know, sort of how I felt, and the things that led me to it, and then maybe give you a minute to to sort of explain what you know how you came upon this, and maybe some of the things that uh, clicked with, within your own experiences throughout life, um, if that works for you. And then we can segue into yeah, whatever you want, yeah. whether you want to go into that other segment about, you know, sort of a, the observation of the whole uh, culture of the thing and the way things are going. Um, but uh, anyway, <laughs> just to sort of give you an example, like to me, I had uh, I had never the, the first time I had ever heard about flat Earth was obviously in school when they told us how stupid it was. They they taught us you know the Earth is a globe and uh, 500 years ago people were so stupid they thought that you'd fall off the edge if you sailed too far ha 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 and so that was really all I knew about the flat Earth up until um, just you know within the last say year um, I had probably seen a couple of links to it on uh, YouTube and on uh, you know the internet and never even gave it a thought I thought that was the you know this must be some sort of a joke why would anyone even click on that never clicked on it probably never would have until uh, just one day a friend of mine and, uh, and I were talking about conspiracy theories and you know he really doesn't believe in them and I'm sort of saying well 9-11 was there's definitely something wrong there um, and he at the end of the conversation he was like well you're not a flat earther are you and I'm like no that isn't a thing is it and he's like uh, no and and my my remark was something along the lines of, well, those people must be gullible that you know they they must be you know stupid or whatever. And it was actually that conversation that I don't know a few weeks later I was just you know messing around on YouTube and I saw something about flat Earth, and so I just decided to look at it and it, it just so happened to be Matt Boyland and he was making a lot of sense and that's what sort of triggered me into looking at this because. See, with me personally, a lot of things clicked very quickly um, with my past experiences on this world, and, and I think that a lot of people tend to have the same sort of epiphany, but then, 
you know, it's almost like we have to double check ourselves and we have to go back through each and every little proof that we always thought, you know, um, proved that we lived on a spinning globe, you know, like the ships, uh, the observations of Columbus and circumnavigation. And, well, the sun, you know, the sun is a sphere, so we must live on a sphere. But when you really go through all these proofs, a lot of it is uh, just presupposition, including, you know, the very, um, the very distance to the sun is uh, 93 million miles away, but that presupposes that the Earth is a sphere. Gravity presupposes gravity exists. So we have all these huge assumptions for the globe model, but uh, for, for the flat, stationary Earth, everything makes so much sense without even any explanation. It just doesn't need an explanation like gravity. So I just thought maybe you could talk a little bit about how you read into this subject and how you um, sort of felt about it at first and what triggered you to sort of hop over to the other side of the fence. Well, the- well, that's where I'm getting to is that I was someone who was um, involuntary put into engineering. My true passion was writing and illustrating and, and more of the um, open-minded aspects. And with the environment I grew up in and maybe get to a little bit of this is was there's only one right answer, and that was the... the uh, <laughs> the person who's writing the check for tuition. And so I was told that it's either engineering or, you know, we don't need you anymore to to be a burden. And what happened was I get, I, I'll try and dance around this because I don't want it to be on a personal issue, but um, use it as an example that... I've got to chop this up. Um, Hold on a second. How do I say this? Yeah, I just, I got to figure out a way to break break through the, I'm going to do this. Um, Ah, jeez. Well, I would say just... um, you know, just maybe improvise, roll with it once you get going. Um. No, you, you know what? Let me go get a cup of coffee, and I just, boy, once I get rolling, I yeah. think I'll be okay, but I just don't know how to make this little segment. Um, let me, I thought I had this better thought out. Let me go get some coffee and, and uh, get my thoughts sure. together. Hold on. Okay. Uh, what the hell? I'm just going to just jump, dive in, and and uh, you do what you need to do after it's in post production because I just got to break through the, yeah, the wall. Yeah, so here. just go ahead and start it, like you know, just as if you were to explain it. No, no worries, no pressure, and um, just sort of go okay. over your thoughts about it, and um, you know, however you want to. It'll it'll all tie together because I. Grew up in a very artificial environment, and dysfunction is probably the easiest way to to say it. But it was all an image and and promotion of things that were very artificial. And 
using the the flat earth is the authority the authority determine what the truth was and not the truth being the authority or how does it go the truth is the authority or the authority is the truth i had a very authoritarian upbringing and no matter what the person said that that's the way it was so general instincts and perceptions were extraordinarily shunned upon because they contradicted what the authoritarian was mandating and determined and having a passion for writing and more open-minded vocational ideas like going into journalism or something that the the only acceptable answer was engineering so being in senior year or late junior year the declaration was made what are you going to do with your life and journalism was thrown on the table it was responded with uh what right for a living i kind of thought that that's what it meant but it wasn't the right answer so father was an engineer my brother was currently at michigan at the time in industrial engineering my father was a mechanical engineer at purdue so so the backup response was well engineering and then figure out what school and again the environment that we were subjected to was a big 10 school so from the get go it was this is what i was supposed to do and it was the only thing acceptable and anything less was well there's the door see ya so quick background there was i'm adopted and had two people that were probably the worst candidates to adopt anyone uh be that as it may they adopted two kids back in late in 59 and 60 and I was part 2 of 2 and my brother was part 1 of 2 and he was the one that that gave the answers and accepted authority being the truth and I was the person who the truth was the authority and so the conflict of interest personally started from the get go and again the reason I threw all that out there earlier was that you know how did i get into the flat earth was that the authority was telling me what was to be true and again with flat earth it's the globe is what's true and not what you perceive so once i got into engineering at purdue i struggled to find out what i wanted to do and I fell in love with the field side of things because of Professor Walker and he was the one that sat up in front of the uh case studies course sophomore year and would just go on and on and on about all these projects he worked on and and he could make a lug nut sound interesting so yeah, he just had a story about everything and at the time I thought I want to be that guy and at CTL I was I became that guy who just flew around and went to all these different job sites and not so much the fact that I went on those stories and I'm sorry I'm my, my wife's in here screaming in my face it's okay it's okay it's I'm no sure big deal it's fine off. it's fine I bought that computer I already told you yes Oh, it's not spam. Yeah, well, it was no, it wasn't seven hundred. I told you I bought that computer. That's why I went down to the store and put the money on the card, Mina. Hot and muddy. All right, I have to edit that out. Okay, so anyways, where were we? Sorry about that. Wow, it's really, really rolling. Yeah, she, thought our, she thought our PayPal <laughs> anyway. account got wiped out. I said, no, I I, I bought that computer. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, it's justified. So, found, found an avenue of civil engineering and first tried to try to the corporate side of things and the corporate side didn't work out very well 
So again, conflict of of what fit naturally versus what I was told should be the way it is. And yeah, and I I totally agree with you. You know, with the whole uh, notion of the truth is the authority, and and that really you know that rings true with me. That resonates with me because. You know, so much of uh, what we believe and what we're led to believe with the globe is, is very flimsy evidence. And if you can just, you know, simply get a person's attention, and um, it, it really helps to have people with uh, credibility and, and the degrees and the experience. I mean, for some reason, um, you know, people think uh, that your voice doesn't matter or your voice doesn't count if you don't have, you know, some degree from Harvard or uh, if you don't work for Na- if you don't work right. for NASA. Like only NASA is the authority on astronomy anymore, and I think that's ridiculous. I think that anybody with a telescope can be a scientist, and anyone with a brain and a pen can be a journalist. You don't have to have a license or a uh, a badge to be either of those things, and so, um, but, you know, it does help us uh, in terms of this whole truth movement, in terms of this whole flat earth movement, to have credible people with experience, um, you know, sort of explaining how how they've arrived at this and, and why it isn't so stupid after all, you know, and so that's, that's really important to me. Right. right, but like many people brought up in the, the strict, you're nothing until you establish credibility, the only way you get credibility is through education in a formal system, the better the the credibility is from a university with a reputation for for anything whatever oh uh, no no i oh man strike that i are an engineer's kicking in that uh you know the bigger the school is the better the school and the better the school is the better the the uh teaching and the education so going to Purdue in Michigan that you're supposed to be this great, wonderful, knowledgeable person. And I left with a sheet of paper and and not knowing much more than how to escape a 68-minute exam and with a passing grade. So, again, when people require all these educations and and uh, alphabets after your name, it's it's you get one person that either – knows the material and doesn't have the the alphabet after their name or you get the people with the alphabet after the name that more than likely are not familiar with the the details and they're focused more on becoming qualified from a paper or perspective standpoint versus a um, background or hands-on background exactly yeah so So the reason I'm showing all these other things about, you know, the goofball and everything else was I took my job as as serious as anyone else, and amongst the staff, people knew that, but, you know, being a serious person was not part of the agenda. So, again, taking things seriously but not being a serious person was immediately misconstrued, and my boss saw... He didn't see a, a person working overtime because they had a workload that demanded it. He saw someone that was that wore bad clothes from J.C. Penney, J.C. Penney's warehouse and Garanimal's collection set, and thought that I was fighting authority because of that, and it was the least the least on my mind. And again, growing up, that I was the flannel shirt and jeans, and and that was taken as yeah, I've never, I've never understood that either. It's like I, you know, you should wear what's comfortable. You know, you should wear what fits. And uh, if you know certain people want to put on a on a tie and, a, and you know all that, that's their prerogative. But if you actually look at where that comes from, it's um, it's not necessarily something that you'd want to be uh, associated with in terms of wearing a necktie. And you can research that on your own. I mean, it's sort of irrelevant to the conversation, but it goes back to it goes back to France, I believe. Wow. So, granimals don't go back to France, but anyway, um, yeah. The the criticism received from the household was, I don't know how to play the game. My brother absolutely knew how to play the game, and. 
And when I started to question authority, being the, the guidance and instruction received in the homestead. You're, you're talking on, you're live, because I'm not muted. I don't need that. I don't no, need I'm that. I'm not talking to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know, I just, you know, I, if we can eliminate well, I've, that. I've, I've asked that, her several times, I've told her that I'm in here recording, and it's like she just doesn't listen, and let's let's just try to continue on. Well, I'm, sorry, John. I'm just going to get a little pissed off that I I'm talking about something that's pretty pretty fragile to talk about, and get it interrupted is I don't need that. You don't mean well, no, to. I'm I'm really to, sorry. I'm apolo- I I okay. apologize. I have no control, okay. but um, it's not going to happen again. So l- just try to continue okay. where you left off, and I'm gonna I'm I'm paying 100 percent attention until the next time sh- I get interrupted. It's, so. Yeah, I I don't know how to pick up. It's just, please don't. Okay. Um, I was yeah. I was following right along Jeez. with you, uh, and I I lose my train of thought pretty easily too. But I, I think that we were sort of uh, discussing, you know, more boots on, how boots on the ground is going to get you a better experience and. Sort of, you know, the difference between that and, uh, you know, the person that's, you know, got all the degrees and all the alphabet num- letters behind their name that knows all everything in theory, but, you know, in practice. But, yeah, it gets back to people telling you what the truth is versus you deciphering it yourself through trial, error, experience, background, everything else. And again, in an extraordinarily confined environment, that I was subjected to was this is the truth and you don't know what you're talking about and it was such a conflict at home that it was I if it got to the point that if um, it took very little to to be removed from the the situation so yeah I am going to try and it might as well just say it is that from when I started to question things and it was taken as attack and personal attacks against character, then I started being attacked. My character was being attacked. And one of the things that uh, an abusive character does is starting to insult and make false accusations and this is only important not from that it occurred on an individual basis is everyone that's decided to take on this truth movement regarding the shape of the planet is you are going to be subjected to and a lot of people have already to a lot of personal attacks that stray way outside the lines of being anything remotely close to the subjects being scrutinized, being the, the shape of the earth, and the character assassination is going to get to such personal levels that it may not even be worth the effort to to have personal lives destroyed. Well, and I'll tell you, when, when I first came out, um, that's... That all I got was attacks from people who thought I was stupid and had all these arguments. And so what that sort of fueled me to do was, um, you know, to make another video and answer a lot of these questions that had simple, simple explanations. And then, of course, you know, there's a million other things that have to be explained in a way that if somebody would actually just sit down and think about most of this stuff on their own, they, you could actually figure it out. But the key to it is, is, is just assuming one model or the other. And that's really what the, the scientific method is about, is taking a look at some, an idea or a hypothesis and testing it against reality, and that's the long and short of it. And if you actually just apply that to reality, um, it's it's really just a very simple thing. And but 
uh, people tend not to be independent thinkers, and I think that's an exact result of our education system being an indoctrination as opposed to uh, teaching people how to think. They teach people what to think. And so it's almost as if the more uh, educated you get, the higher in rank you get in, educate, in education, it's almost like the more brainwashed you are, um, especially if you don't have any real-world experience. But, uh, you know, I, I guess w where I'm going with this is, it's just such a simple thing, and that when people ask questions, they're really just trying to understand how this whole thing works. And, I, you know, honestly, I only ever uh, set out to make one or two videos about this topic, but there's just so many people that want to, you know, that, that need certain things explained, that don't understand, you know, something. And, and I, there's certain things that I don't understand. I mean, I'm not saying I know everything about, you know, the, the world and the universe, but um, there's, there's a lot of this that's very obvious and very simple simple, and um, a lot of it's very measurable, and so, you know, it's just nice to have the truth behind you um, when you're in an argument or a debate with somebody, but the difficulty here is, is you have to unlearn everything that you've basically learned as true for your entire life. It's, it's almost like debating a child about Santa Claus, because first you have to convince the child and kind of crush his, his, uh, his dream of this whole reality of Santa to debate him about it, because that's, that's exactly what the, I mean, it's a perfect an analogy. Uh, the globe is a lie. The globe is Santa Claus, and when you try to explain this to somebody, it's almost as if you're uh, crushing their entire paradigm, because it really does change one's viewpoint when you do realize that the world is uh, stationary uh, and it's not a globe, then that changes our perspective, you know, it changes our place in the universe, really, and it, it puts a, a level of importance on, on us and this world that uh, doesn't exist in the heliocentric model. So, you know, to me, I don't think we should have any enemies in the flat earth movement, I, I think our enemy should be the heliocentric model. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, we get attacks. I've been attacked by nothing but globe earthers for the duration. So I made videos in response to those attacks and arguments. And I want a lot of people over to the flat earth. But now it's like I'm getting attacked even from within the flat earth community. Um, that, this includes everyone from Eric Duvet right in the beginning. He, in response to my very first video, he attacked me and banned me from IFERS. Um, I I've also been attacked by Tiger Dan. I've been attacked by Jeff Stewart, Matt Boylan. And so I'm not sure where all of this is coming from, but, you know, the only reason I've ever did any of this was just to get the truth out and hopefully convince or show or point one person, one single person in the right direction, uh, you know, and, and then it's mission accomplished. And, and so that's sort of where my approach is, is coming from on, on that and in that respect. And again, what I'm having a difficult time to kind of step through is trying to separate the, a personal issue with a professional uh, item, and the, the conflict was having someone that tells you the way things are, and all of a sudden, they get attacked because you don't believe what they're saying and they they are forced into not only defending themselves but tearing you down in the process of preserving their paradigm and that's what's going to happen here is all the people that have relied on 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 this model are are going to do whatever they can to preserve it and the easiest people to, to indicate are the NASA's and, and the educational system that teaches this model. Well, and you, you know, and the shame with the educational system is that they're going to teach what the federal doctrine says they're going to teach. So you, not, you can't necessarily blame them for that. I mean, we're the it's our society at large that's allowed this to happen. And so, you know, if whatever NASA says is to be taken as absolute fact, then sure, the federal school system is going to teach it. And the teachers, you know, they're not necessarily in on this whole hoax. But, you, you know, uh, inadvertently or, you know, unwittingly, they sure are, right? Right. And 
it is going to get nasty because once they're threatened and see right now they're getting threatened, but the threat isn't publicly known and it isn't affecting them on a uh, personal level. It's there's rumblings in the horizon, but you know nothing is is on the forefront to to really compromise their their reality and what what this whole thing is going to do with and I don't like the the label but the truth movement regarding the the shape of the earth is to break down not only the perception of everyone's world but the the understanding and the magnitude of the deception that's been occurring and tying it to what happened on a personal level is that I've been in my, involved with my own little truth, <laughs> my own little truth movement since, since forever regarding things that occurred while we we're growing up. And I'm going to dance around it, but eventually come right out is the reason that I'm talk about the the health is that I've had um, bad joints since forever and when it got to a point where I questioned the father and his upbringing and he's one of these that had these outrageous stories of growing up he was born in Tokyo and claimed that his parents were extraordinarily wealthy steel magnets in the steel industry in Japan and at the outbreak of World War II that his family was held prisoners and he was a POW and tortured and just these outrageous claims that before I started questioning them, they, they certainly had their merit because, one, at eight years old, you don't have no reason to, to question these things. But but as I got older, I started asking very simple questions about this background that the answers were never there. And a person that just took absolute offense to any questions regarding his personal background to the point where it made me question it more. Yeah. So, and, you know, you think the last thing, if I, I don't want the guy to talk about how he was tortured, but at least give a background on, you know, so how did you learn to speak in six languages if you were a POW? How was it that, you know, you had lots of money, but these your parents can't even string a normal sense together because they have no formal background in business or training. I mean, they're just simpleton people. And nothing about that, but they're certainly not a leader in a steel organization, a steel magnet in the steel industry in Japan. He comes from a European background. So this whole thing started to fall apart with the story of my father so from you know the ready son who has hair that looks like a peter brady wig master that started questioning the authority that i started getting attacked back so i've been accused of being a liar from the get-go from the upbringing so not that I'm an honest person by nature. I, mean, I don't lie because of of what happened. If I got caught in a lie, and the worst lie I can think of was in high school, where it was, "Did you check the oil in your car?" And the easiest answer was yes, because I could, with everything that was going on in high school, said yes, and came back and said, "Well." I just checked it, and it's low, and it's not fine, and so that was almost reason for eviction. Oh, wow. What it took, to, oh, yeah. And so it took a while to figure out why why things were getting so blown out of proportion was that there was this breakdown with the individual who started questioning authority, and it got to the point where if a senior year, if I had breathed wrong, that that was it. There's well, the it's door. Well, funny, it's funny because it's, I, I know exactly what you mean, and, and I, I believe it was either during 
uh, middle, yeah, I believe it was during middle school when we were, you know, in science class and the teacher's talking about, uh, the, the, your weight is rendered, your mass is rendered on the scale with weight because of barometric pressure. And there's essentially just huge, really just vast, uh, column of weight of, uh, just all the air of atmospheric pressure pushing down and around and in all directions on you. And so my question was, well, what, you know, what about gravity? I thought that's what's keeping, you know, putting our weight on the scale. And of course, there really isn't an answer for this except for, oh, well, gravity's what was pushing the air down. And so, well, what, well, which is it? Is it the, is, is gravity pushing the air down or is the air pushing me down or is gravity pushing us both down? But then when you think about it, okay, well, what's holding the air in at the top? Uh, we're talking about the infinite vacuum of space at the top. So what's keeping the air from just zipping out? And so that's combative in a science class and you, they just basically explain it away and they, they say, that you're disruptive. They really do. Um, another example, when I was, I think I was 10 or 11, um, I took, and I told you about this, but I took a flight from Florida to Texas and back, and I was just totally confounded because the, the two flight times were identical in duration when I was expecting, you know, the flight to Texas to be a lot shorter because of the spin of the earth. And I told my aunt, I believe my words were, uh, the, the earth isn't spinning. And, she, you know, she basically explained it away to me, and, and so did my father. And so, you know, I didn't find it any past that, but I, I probably should have, but um, you know, so I do know what you I do know what you mean. People tend to ostracize you if you question the uh, conventional wisdom, right? Right. Right. And when I started questioning the the authority and and the character of the authority that was telling me what is and isn't, that when their paradigm was being threatened, that there's the counterattack, and what happened was. Again, I'm going to plow through a root initially, and it's going to break down fast. But I'll try and try and glue it together. But um, after so after graduate school, took this job in Chicago, moved from Ann Arbor back to Chicago, and concurrent with that, uh, my parents went through a separation, and so the initial thing was a 30-year marriage that was was publicly considered, you know, they've been together and they're great people and we have this wonderful Brady Bunch persona that everything's perfect. They had the perfect house and this is a basically middle white collar, middle class upbringing. Father was a vice president at International Harvester Truck, so he had the corporate side and, and we were resume children with one that's at Michigan with a studying industrial engineering and the other one who's a knucklehead that we know of but publicly he's going to Purdue and pursuing engineering and did it to do so when I graduated from Michigan uh, and personally going through parents were going through a divorce and I couldn't think of anything better for two people that absolutely hate each other was to get divorced. And so they collectively decided to come after me and, and attack my character. So there's a separation of, of myself from these people who, one, couldn't, couldn't indicate who I was from any person that, uh, any friend or association and two wanted nothing to do with me. Wow. So so after when they were going through their separation, I finally figured out what I wanted to do in life. I had this tremendous job and and at the time I had never dated. This goes back to something that happened in high school and just throwing it out there that the first person that Everyone has their little gaga moments. Well, the first gaga moment for me was this person that we went out with on a, on one date, and then a week later she was killed in a car oh accident. God. And then eight days later, a friend that close friend, run around friend, was, his father fell off his roof raking leaves. And he oh was killed. So, first week of, 
senior or no first month of senior year in high school was fairly um, busy with growing up yeah, issues. Yeah, that's crazy. And then, and then uh, in February, I was in a car accident where I T-boned a Ford station wagon with a with a, I was in a Volkswagen Bug and an old barge Ford station wagon versus a Volkswagen Bug skidding sideways and T-boning head on, um, I lost. Oh, <laughs> and so I had internal bleeding and, and I missed a month of school because of that. And so there are quite a few things. Senior year was quite eventful. And um, at the time, it was, so what are you going to do with your life? And you were supposed to get your hair cut. And why didn't you get your hair cut? Because just because you got in a car accident or in the hospital, and they're two hours away from surgery, removing your spleen because you've lost six units of blood or four units or whatever. Oh, yeah, I was... I mean, <laughs> I was losing so much blood because they're taking it every two hours. But, uh, yeah, I was on standby. And, again, being a knucklehead in senior year in high school, that um, at one point there were probably 15-plus people in my hospital room, and and my parents were kind of on the peripheral being overwhelmed by high school stupidity. And all of a sudden, doctor comes in and grabs my mother and pulls her out, and she comes back into the room, and and there's this little hush, and she goes, "You're dying!" Oh my God! <laughs> so everyone in the room just kind of looks up and goes, "Well, hope you get better. See ya!" Oh my God! <laughs> so that, that was like a verbal fart that just kind of cleared the room, and. So, again, that was the environment that I was subjected to, and um, they were more interested that, I mean, father was more interested that I had no direction in my life, and I didn't get my hair cut, and they were out of town when I was in my wreck. So, again, the school, college kind of started off on the wrong foot because I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. And again, filling in the blanks was that was what was happening behind the scene. That's what you don't see on resumes. What you see on resumes were kind of what I showed earlier was all the all the good stuff. I don't need to go right, right. No, I follow. You. Yeah. So, okay. So so now we're jumping through to the '90s where I kind of get my act together. I when I was down in Houston to get over the death thing, I volunteered at the Children's Hospital and kind of got close with one of the kids there because the kid just flat out challenged me and said, you're only here to meet girls. And I was only there to meet girls, but I didn't like this little smart alecky kid calling me <laughs> on it. So, so Steve Brucker and I just kind of hooked up because, one, he challenged me flat out um, you play chess with him, and I honestly lost to this kid. And he goes, "You're just losing to make me feel good." He had cystic fibrosis, and and children at the time, when I think 30 percent of them were were dead before they got out of their teens. So so the volunteering just kind of got me into an environment to better understand life and death. And again, I look back and it's like, here's this guy, and I dropped. You know, 60, 80 bucks at happy hour because I had that salary I talked about and felt guilty about it. And again, I was told that money was everything and money buys you happiness. And, and the thing is, I made lots of money and certainly wasn't, I enjoyed what I was doing, but I didn't fit in the, the corporate environment. So I kind of fell back on doing my thing and wearing the silly ties and, and just doing a, I thought doing a good job was going to get me where I needed to go. And that was anything but true. And again, Jake never had anything about my work product. He just didn't like me as a person. And that was far more important to the company than, than someone, you know, that didn't dress, that came into work with a sleeves rolled up. And didn't drive a nice car. I had a Volkswagen without a back seat, and running. It was a yabba dabba 
do mobile because they didn't have floorboards. <laughs> yeah, what? I do know that a, v, a VW, the, the floorboards will rot out. I've actually uh, repaired a few with uh, fiberglass. So, yeah, that'll happen. Right, so so I took my the first thing I bought when I the first paycheck. I didn't have any furniture, but the first thing I bought was a jukebox. Yeah. So again, that was that was my priority was and before I even had furniture, I had a four hundred dollar Rockola that could play Chuck Berry albums, and that was more important to me than than having a nice car or something. But the way it, it came across was this rebellious maverick and every. Everything else that that drove bad cars to taunt, you know, thumb my nose at management, and it wasn't the intention at all. And anyway, getting off a little subject, so or was I on the the personal? So so there's separation from the family, and and so after Houston, this kid, the cystic fibrosis. We just maintained our our friendship when I moved to Chicago and went to grad school. That was, he was down in Houston, and this will be important later on. And um, so now what we're so so I started dating after Michigan, and when I got the job at CTL, they had, they had this incredible job. They had the opportunity to fly around the country, do, basically, it was a journalistic job where he did the investigation and got to write about it. I took all my photographs and put together a little story. So that's why I love my job so much was it was like being a photojournalist with an engineering background. So that was my 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 ticket that's awesome. and I that's really yeah. awesome to be able to to you know do what you enjoy for a living and I agree I mean I totally love doing you know projects and you know things like puzzles and, and stuff like that and so when, when you're able to approach your your line of work in such a way where you actually are passionate about it and get excited and you actually want to get up and you know and get off to work that's you know there's something to that that not not everybody can say that they have and so that's you know it's it's a very fortunate thing when people are able to do that um and you know i've done my fair yeah. share of digging ditches to be sure and i, I never enjoyed that um uh, but I, you know i'd much rather be doing something you know along the lines of creative work or like photojournalism and, and that sort of thing so I, I definitely appreciate where you're coming from in that regard right but i was stupid because of my my interests and that carried its weight for you know their opinion started to go out to other people so so again people that live their life as a lie which you know the again when i started questioning the personal background to to this individual who adopted me that was a, a direct threat against them and the world that they felt was reality and as their stories broke down, they became more offensive, and and the only thing they had left for their authority was money. And when money no longer becomes an influence, they've lost total control. And when they lost total control, they go to survival mode, and that's attacking the individual who's questioning them. And that's what you guys are going through is people attacking you any way possible. You're attacking your character and false accusations. And that's what started happening to me was a father who who could not stand the fact that I loved what I did and was, the word successful can be overused, was people like the product that I brought to the table, so they ended up using me because I brought them what they wanted. Not all the time. I brought them more than they wanted, which we sure. talked just sure. talked about. But but the bottom line is, if I've got a garage in New York and I need someone to go out there and, and document and find out what we've got, well, we know who to do and who to send and who who will maintain a budget. And, and like Dyke Stadium, that was a 100% survey, and the budget for it was just this ridiculous amount. But he developed techniques that we could 
go out there and and have a base sheet and just take a photograph of what we were seeing and through the photo document documentation process be able to go back to the office and have a co-op student or, or a lower price person document everything instead of a ninety hundred twenty dollar an hour engineer go out to the field and and write it down on a piece of paper so again there were techniques that that i was able to to derive that enabled things to be done a lot faster and a lot more economically and that took a that was where my my right side of my brain really kicked in was from you know call like it is that I was the arty farty engineer that made little wire models to show congestion of reinforcement and that was unique to what other engineers brought to the table and not saying that it was that they were bad and I was you know right or or I was wrong and they were right it was just it was one complement the other and where guys were good at the calculations and the analytical side that I was a little bit more adaptive and resourceful from the presentation of of what we were finding. So, so again, it was it was the good fit. But as I did all these investigations, there was the breakdown of my body. And just to kind of throw this out there, was had surgery, knee surgeries in seventy nine, eighty, and eighty one, eighty two, eighty three, and eighty four. Wow. Had some arthroscopic done. Then 85, when I was moving from Houston back to Chicago, had a reconstructive surgery. And a week later, my leg almost fell off. And so they had to put me back in. And so there's your eight surgeries before I'm 25. Oh, and actually, on that last one, I had to go back in again because after the second surgery in a week, I had an allergic reaction to the benzodiazepine. Or, uh, Bened, benzoin. Now, now and is, are most of these surgeries as a result of that uh, original accident? Well, we will okay. get to that. <laughs> we will get to that. So, yeah, so there's a lot of medical issues with knees. I went back to... Because we'll, uh, I was, I was uh, pretty know, fortunate. I, I think I told you briefly, but I was uh, right, riding my motorcycle down the road October 10th of last year, so not 2015, but 2014, because uh, it just rolled over again. So October 10th, 2014, I was just riding my motorcycle down the road through a green light, 25 miles an hour, and a guy just uh, runs the red light and just creams me and uh, smacked, I smacked, I literally, like, turned to look towards him, so I smacked my face against the windshield. Uh, luckily, I had a helmet on, and I was wearing a leather jacket, but, uh, I mean, I had some damage that, uh, you know, some nerve damage and uh, some sprains and some bruises and stuff like that, but ultimately, you know, luckily, I was uh, fairly well okay uh, to the point I didn't need any surgeries or anything, but... You know, something like that can happen to you when you're walking down the street or when you're driving down the road. You never know when something's going to happen. And so, um, you know, it just it really does go to show you that uh, life is life is not a permanent thing that we tend to think it is. So, right. Yeah. And um, so going back with the knee issue was I had knee problems from from since forever and I was told that I didn't. <laughs> so um, I, the person who had to pay the insurance and the, the bills for the kid in the family um, didn't like the answer or the, the statement that kid had bad knees. And so I was told what the truth was, and, and what, in this picture, one of these persons are Melvin Cole, who went on to play defensive lineman for Iowa Hawkeyes and was the, I think, 1983 or 80, 81 or 83 MVP, defensive lineman MVP for the, the Rose Bowl. And one of them was a white kid who was a gym aide and didn't, wasn't allowed to take any P.E. because of a medical excuse. Huh. Now, again, I know we look alike, but this is Melvin Cole, 
and this is the white kid that had a medical excuse because of knees. Okay, right. <laughs> so, anyway, so that's, so anyway, uh, even though I had a doctor and all these people saying you do have, it was diagnosed as Osgood Schlatter's and Osgood Schlatter's disease is where the bone structure grows faster than the ligaments and the tendons. Uh-huh and starts tearing up the joint that way. Um, what truly was occurring was I have a asymmetrical rotation of both legs. So I've got one leg that points at 11 o'clock and the right leg points at 2 o'clock. So, so yeah, it's, but one of my passions was skiing. Oh, yeah, that'll, so, that'll be terrible so. of the knees, that skiing. So I was naturally so born at was it uh, pizza and scissors and or whatever and and um, anyway so so again these are these are little white gym aid and and uh, anyway anyway I was told that I didn't have any knee issues but um, you know whatever where am I going with this so so when I had this job, so I finishing off, I had another knee surgery in 89 ACL, and I had just started working at CTL. Then 93, I had arthroscopic surgery. 94, my back started breaking down, and in March, I had disectomy, laminectomy at L5-S1. That November, it re-herniated, and had a fusion at L5-S1. 97, the fusion was bad, so they had to redo the fusion and take out the hardware. So I had another surgery in 97. Then in 2000, I had another fusion at L5-S1 where they took out the old fusion, had to break it, and had an anterior and posterior fusion. So in 13 years, I had eight knee and back surgeries. Uh, at the beginning of my career at CTL, I had gone out with a person who went to school with, and she dated my roommate in college, and we went down to Jamaica because I had just gotten over a knee surgery, and she had chicken pox, and we went down there and had a great time, came back, and we ended up getting married. Blow through the, the career at CTL when I'm flying around the world here, she's back here, and that just didn't work out. So at the end of, of a decade of a, a silly, silly relationship, we called it quit. Um, yeah, I guess um, it would be sort of hard if you're always on the road, you know, to keep a relationship going. Well, that, that was the best part of the relationship. The bottom line is neither one of us should have ever gotten married to begin with. It was, again, one of those things on paper looked great and in reality was a disaster. Again, the reason I'm not saying this to be critical of others, it's how it's going to affect what truth is. Because, jumping right into it, is when I... At the end of 2000, when I had the back surgery that knocked me out of my career, I had already confronted a father with things that had occurred when we were younger. And that started after he walked out of the house with an abundant porn collection that included things of every variety you can think. Yeah. That feedback. Oh, did you get some feedback? Yep. All of a sudden, yep. All of a sudden huh. Someone, someone might be listening. Oh, I don't know. Well, anyway, uh, so there were some issues with, uh, so you said your dad was walked out with a porn collection. and Right, and again, it, it was the breakdown of their world, and I had a... Career-wise, a great thing, but then it was starting to fall apart, and health took over. And in '99, my mother died, so there was a clash of of personal issues going on. And what happened was that I had, after I had confronted him with issues, 
then they came after me. And this is where the breakdown of truth and reality and the paradigm of one world's ending and another one trying to break out of out of planet stupid here. This is where I used to live. I don't live here anymore. <laughs> And the bottom line is, they started to attack me, and all of a sudden, I started getting feedback from people saying that, you know, how do I jump into this, is that I didn't have knee issues and and orthopedic issues, that it was more had a drinking and a drug problem with pain meds, and despite all the surgeries and everything else, that their story won out from what was occurring. And again, this is where it doesn't matter what the facts are because it's who owns truth that will get the message out. And so in 2000, I was laid up and my world was working at CTL, and after that was gone, and mother died, and and family basically started coming to attack me. Uh, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so their story started not winning. It was that became the truth. So all of a sudden now, this guy with all these surgeries and back issues, people started questioning what was really going on. And it gets worse. That instead of all those surgeries, what, according to others, were occurring, was that I was visiting mental facilities. So these are, these are just, so, uh, just rumors, just un unsubstantiated rumors. No, no. This was, hey, he has a drug and he has a drinking and drug problem, and he didn't have as many knee and back surgeries as you think. He had mental issues, and he was in psych wards for months at a time, and using bad knees and bad back as an excuse for attention because he's delusional. And then it started getting into not only was a drunk and a drug addict that I was had mental issues and paranoid schizophrenia. And again, this was what was being disseminated as truth based on the fact that I was out of work for months at a time. And so, again, it didn't matter what kind of x-rays or scars or anything. And people that I knew growing up, I mean, going back to not to, that's why it's like, I don't want to show these, just say, ooh, I had knee and back surgery. It's that people were were just saying, this didn't happen. Right. And he, he can fake x-rays, and he can put his name on these x-rays. And... And that ended up winning. Oh, wow. So despite, uh, again, this is character. This was me. This was um, this is me being a structural engineer that I could balance these things. And then it collapsed. <laughs> of course. But, but the, the arty farty guy of me was this, like the Springsteen thing. I painted the Born to Run on. I did it on a mirror, and this one was on glass, and it on canvas. But so this little thing traveled around me from moved from Houston to Chicago to to Ann Arbor and back to Chicago. And then as soon as I got to Chicago, I moved the chair that was propping up it, propping it up. I are an engineer that was propping it up, and it wiped out. But anyway, point being was all this started getting questioned as, I didn't do this, someone else did. Huh. Further, um, that this was, being a weird Santa Claus, this was a beach party when I was at Marathon that thought it'd be interesting to, and I advertise this, is I'm going to get a ton of sand in my apartment and I'm going to have a beach party. <laughs> So word got around with, this guy's going to put a ton of sand in his apartment. And so I kind of took that as a challenge is, well, if I'm going to say I'm going to do a beach party and say I'm going to put it, I just meant it figuratively. But then, so what I did was I got, oops, I was an Australian cowboy. 
but um, I got 20 hundred pound bags of torpedo sand, put down a couple layers of visqueen, so I had a ton of sand in my apartment. <laughs> And I could probably find the, the other pictures, but had a jukebox over here, and so in the apartment was the, the ton of sand. Well, that story got out to corporate marathon, and so then I became the engineer that, not, not the engineer that was doing a new production and drilling platform in the Gulf of Mexico, East Cameron 321 Platform B and C. It was the guy who had a ton of sand in his apartment and had a beach party. So, again, so do, do you feel um, like there was there were any specific people or maybe elements that were sort of uh, – that had some sort of an agenda or a motive to discredit you – or was it um, just were, was it just for some sort of insurance purposes or? What, I I kind of lost you. Um, well, I mean, I. Oh no! This was a person. No, no, this was just a person who 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 was I to question him, and it was every opportunity for him to attack the person attacking right, okay. him. Okay, so attacking your character and, as opposed to you know your work and your your actual professionalism and that sort of thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, it's it's who holds the dollar and who holds the biggest thread, and and most of the time the biggest biggest thread is the the dollar and that was the least of my concern exactly. so hey real, like, real quick brian um we're at about two hours 20 minutes so yeah if oh, we can you, try to wrap it wrap it up in the next 10 or 15 or so that'd be great and i gotta run to the bathroom real quick if you don't mind no i'm gonna do the same no i'm okay. gonna do the same Sorry. okay All right, I'm back. I don't know if you are. Oh. Awkward stuff. Okay, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yep. And the whole point of this is not, woe is me and these things happen to me and everything else. It's the fact that you had someone dictating your life and telling you what the truth was. And when their paradigm started falling apart and collapsing, that's the only thing they could do is try and destroy destroy the person who's 
tearing down their world. And that's exactly what's going to happen here as, as the people who, and I'm going to just call it from here on out, that this is planet stupid. And if you live here, you better get off because this world, this world, planet stupid, is going to get obliterated. And if you don't wake up now, there will be a time where you're going to be the one with a smug little guy with bad knees, bad back, and a neck that's collapsing that's going to say, I told you so. Right. <laughs> And so I have no problem with that whatsoever because I know what people get like when their world falls apart, that they are going to do everything in the world to tear you down. So, so again, I have this going on and people going around saying, hey, he's off in a mental ward. And, and all I had, you know, a story from that supported them was having a, a couple of DUI arrests are, are certainly fuel that, that got a lot of credit mileage in the alcoholic department. And from a, a drug addict standpoint was being on pain meds gets you a drug addiction conviction. Right. And, 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 you know, personally, I don't think either of those things should matter. Um, lots of people get DUIs and um, pain medication. If you've got these kind of issues, you got to take something for pain. I mean, it's just sometimes unbearable. And so, you know, I don't see – I mean, I can see where they're going to use that or try to use that against you. But um, I have, personally, I've had two DUIs. And um, the first one I got when I was 17, actually – and so, you know, people, you know, uh, and, and by the way, uh, DUI can be just a couple of drinks. And so even if you think you're responsible and, you know, even even you, even the person that thinks you will never get, uh, you know, pulled over after driving home after just a couple drinks, um, sooner or later, you know, it, it's going to happen just because it's, uh, you know, we're more and more into a police state anymore. And so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so again, people that are trying to destroy you and preserve them started when I lost my world at, at uh, the work I loved, that I was sitting in a garden apartment in, in uh, oh my gosh, Oak Park, and, and these people are out disseminating that I really didn't have all these other medical issues, and the real issue was mental illness. And the only reason I say these things about a girl in high school getting killed was because I wanted sympathy, and I make up these things to get attention. And it was it was a laughable concept from my standpoint because I didn't think there was a person on the planet that would would ever give any credence to that at all but again the power of suggestion is well it also gets into what's easier to do is not get involved or and i wasn't asking people to get involved but it was don't don't give consideration to to these other things because they knew me and the reason I brought up the volunteer work in the children's hospital was that that was used against me as I was the pedophile. Oh, wow. And, oh, yeah. So it gets, that's trying to go full spectrum where the person who did all those things to the individual who's attacking them decides to use their life and label me with yeah, it. And that's, you know, that's, so, it's such a, a, psycho, a psychopath will tend to do that, too. Um, they'll tend to take their shortcomings or wrongdoings and sling accusations of such a nature on somebody they're trying to discredit. And um, somebody that's a, a lie, somebody that's willing to lie like that is just awful. But there, you know, there are people out there. Well, I certainly am familiar with that lifestyle because, uh, again, the, the attacks were were pretty pretty relentless. And again, I'll I'll just uh, jump back out of that issue. But um, going back to why I got involved with the flat Earth was when my world was destroyed after 
uh, not destroyed. That's that's too dramatic. After uh, my work as a field evaluation engineer ended, that I fell back on uh, pursuing the writing. John, I can really hear you. It's all right. <laughs> so, um, thank you. And so, part two of life was after going through divorce and getting out of the world where where people were attacking was to move move myself to the shores of Pentwater and pursue a writing and um, illustrating vocation. And even though I was certainly eligible for Social Security at the time, that was the least of my consideration, just from a personal principle standpoint. So, so I, with what money I had in, in the divorce, it was to uh, um, settlement on the house because everything was in my name, and and I paid for for all the mortgage, but. Uh, the only stipulation in the divorce settlement was either sell the house collectively or for her to buy me out of my half. But in that process, I um, had a father who decided to to throw his influence over to the soon-to-be ex-wife, and so they used in court that I was a drug addict, paranoid schizophrenic, who couldn't work and was trying to sue her for money because I was too lazy to work. And so that affected my the divorce settlement where she refused to pay and settle in accordance with the, the divorce terms. And again, now you have a father getting involved with outside issues in, that are, are used and... Again, people start talking about what happened to them as a kid. What happened to them as a kid is is probably the the last thing that affects you in life. It's as you get older that that person is going to still either they they accept what they did or they will defend the person accusing them. And again, I I lost the the truth. I wasn't able to tell the truth better than they could tell lies. Wow, that's awful. Well, that was my life because when when I scraped everything together and moved over to Pentwater, that concurrent with that, I met another person and I raced on sailboats back then. Okay, no shit. And so that was my passion. My only passions in life were the job I had, skiing and sailing. And so after CTL, I lost that passion, but I was still able to do the racing. And going here, this kind of gets into going back to you know all this. We all know the stories with the the guy, the weatherman, saying when they could be on the shores of of Michigan City and see yeah. Chicago in the distance of what their opinion of that was. Right, yeah. Well, I think it was from uh, Mears State Park, uh, New Jersey, looking over to the Chicago skyline was 55 miles, and they said it was a superior mirage, and people believe them. Well, the offshore is that there's in the fall a race, well, September, is a race called the Tri-State. In the Tri-State race, you start in Chicago, you go to St. Joe's, then St. Joe's next day is to Michigan City, Michigan City back to Chicago. This is about 30 miles, and when we started off, we could every now and then see Chicago off in the distance like a citadel. You know, you got extremely, you have extremely clear air, and you got the skyline, the skyline of Chicago kind of beat breaking out of the the water horizon. So from the beginning of the race, you're just staring at the skyline of Chicago in this drag race. 
and so you're in constant view. So when I hear that knucklehead weatherman saying, oh, it's a mirage and light parallax, and it's just laughable. It really is. So It really it, is. And, and anyone that's been out on the sea or on a really flat surface, uh, like, you know, say the salt flats or out in, like, even Florida is a very f- flat place or Kansas is very flat, but uh, any any big giant body of water like the ocean – um, you, you'll definitely see that it's a plane, and uh, it, the, the 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 ground or the sea level doesn't fall away from you in every direction. It just it just doesn't. And uh, yeah, if you can see that skyline from 50 miles away, or even 30 miles, or even 20 miles away, something seriously seriously wrong with the globe model there. Yeah. Right. So again, it's are you going to, as an individual, are you going to listen to someone else telling you what you're seeing versus what you see yourself and hearing another story that makes sense? And again, the only reason I'm bringing up personal issues is because everyone in my world knew what the truth was. But then all of a sudden, this other world with the person who is trying to preserve their fall, their little fantasy absolutely destroys another person's reality. And that reality is what is truth and fact. So again, I could go back into to my little struggles with trying to not only defend myself from every false accusation, because again, when he came out swinging, I'm a 75% Irish knucklehead and I came out swinging as hard as I could. And so when I was accused of being a pedophile because I worked at a children's hospital, you know, I gave everyone the, the, the phone number. Again, I look back and trying to defend myself is it's just futile. And I, I'm making that, that claim to everyone else. When you go out and try to, no matter how noble, no matter how sincere and genuine you think you sound, the, what, it can be a lie. Was the boy that you had sort of become uh, friends with and played chess with? Yeah, Steve did Rucker. He, did, he, did he survive long, or was he? No, he, the first year, in fact, uh, I started July, in July 88, and that Thanksgiving he took really ill, but... You know, we had maintained a friendship or correspondence for three years post my moving from Houston. And again, when I was down there, he goes, I'll never see you again. You know, you're just here to meet girls. And and after you leave, then I'll never see you again. And, and I really liked the kid. He was just a great kid. But he just challenged me personally that way. And, and I liked him because he challenged me. So we maintained our correspondence, and when I was at Michigan, I went down there, picked him up, and we drove up from Houston to Chicago. I took him to a football game and flew him back, and on the drive up, the kid bought about $80 worth of fireworks, and I then realized that the kid's flying back to to Houston, and so he had we went to a field so he could blow off $80 worth of of fireworks and started a field on fire and anyway so uh, yeah he took ill my first year at CTL and I went down there and he didn't pass at the time but um, he ended up not not getting till Christmas at that point oh, so man, that's sad. yeah that was yeah and again the kid, poor kid spent at least well over half of his life, if not two-thirds of his life in a hospital. And those people knew what the the real world was because they just, it is what it is. And, and people that live with diversity are more genuine than anyone else in the world. And that was, again, I look back and I was such a knucklehead, as it were, buying jukeboxes and going to happy hours and dropping 80 bucks because I feel guilty. I'm making more than the accounting department that, uh, you know, I pulled myself aside somehow to do this little adult thing at a kid's hospital. But then 15 years later, it's used against me as me being a pedophile. Yeah, that's terrible. So, again. That's that's what happens of these personal attacks. 
and it's only going to get worse. Yeah. Hey, uh, so, hey, listen, we're at two hours thirty-seven minutes, so let's just cut it off. Yeah, cut it off. Add, there's, it's going to get too un- unwieldy if we, if we go much longer on this on the video. So, um, and it's getting pretty late anyway. It's uh, it's one fifteen, so. Uh, we can pick up, uh, let's see, what's tomorrow? Monday, I don't think I've got anything going on tomorrow afternoon. Um, you know, maybe not too early, like uh, 2, 3 o'clock or something, uh, we can pick up and uh, maybe, you know, get into some uh, some of the Eclipse stuff, or did you still want to? Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely want to do that, but I just try to make that little gap on how I was a guy running around the country, how that uh, ended abruptly, because I haven't even told you the bad story. Uh, I'm just laying the foundation. No, 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 no. That's just the foundation to what happened in 2008, 2007. Okay, and, and that was more of to do with, like, 9-11 and such? That's what how I got into 9-11 was because all those stories that happened to me with the family attacking me, I ended up pulling myself together. I got remarried, moved to Pentwater, and tried to start up again and ended up running out of money. And then all of a sudden I got a job in Chicago and and had the another incredible opportunity, decided to um, – get back into the the business environment and picked up and was going to be the starting up a structural evaluation group at the the largest material testing consulting firm in I don't know if it's the world but certainly the United States and starting up at 90 branch offices was to start up a structural evaluation group and a couple months into that, that they found out about my back surgeries. And at the time, concurrent with me going to Chicago for weeks at a time, my wife decided to have an affair. And then I came back and I told you this, that over Thanksgiving, I had a father-in-law, a Chicago cop, union president, that took me out with a drug interaction so then that what's that's what kicked in this other story with hey we've got a story that goes back to at least 2000 of this kid having mental problems so we're just going to pick up where that one left off so the family got to, i mean my in-laws got together with my family had the whole storyline laid out so when i woke up after five days in a drug-induced coma not knowing what's going on i go to a psych ward for real and everyone you know they lay the groundwork that i had this long history of mental illness and i didn't have orthopedic surgeries but they were mental hospitalizations and <laughs> And so I was treated as such. So That's meanwhile, night, I had this nightmare. job. Oh, so I had this job that disappeared because they they thought I was delusional, thinking I was working. And then I'm still trying to figure out why I was passed out for for five days. And on the medical exam, they realized that I had a stroke. Oh, and even though even though I had the scar tissue from a recent stroke, they didn't diagnose it. They they had tentatively diagnosed it as herpes simplex encephalitis, which is basically a brain stroke, or, you know, some facsimile thereof, but they didn't treat it that way. So I'm running around with a massive headache for a year and a half, trying to figure out what's going on, and pull the pieces together, get the medical records. And again, this is where Mr. Fact Finder is finally going to put to rest and prove to the world that, you know, father who's been swinging at me saying I'm a pedophile and everything else here's the truth he's not a POW he's living in his own little fantasy world and da 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 and and all of a sudden um I, I'm losing everything and absolutely no one, no one believes anything. I've got three pounds of surgical titanium in me. No proof of it because I lost all my medical records in a house foreclosure. 
Because after the stroke and lost my job, I didn't have any money, and the house went into foreclosure. I had ten pounds of at least ten pounds of MRIs that got lost. My wife told the police chief that I was suicidal, so they hauled me into the psych ward again. And during my stay in the psych ward again, a bunch of friends who were trying to help out emptied my house, put it in storage, and then the the sheriff put the foreclosure statement on the front door and locked oh, me out. because it had been vacated. Right, yeah. Right. So so then I'm locked out, and again, it's it's funny if it's not no, you. No, that's terrible. No, it's <laughs> terrible. And, you know, I've been uh, sort of, you know, forced out of a home before, and it's nothing, uh, nothing to laugh at at all. So on that note, um, I think uh, it's a good place to sort of pause for this session. Um, tomorrow we'll sort of uh, pick up and, and go into the, the stuff that you did in terms of uh, exposing 9-11 and the uh, engineers behind the uh, official narrative because uh, I think that's uh, important. And uh, maybe on the next session or the following we'll get into the eclipse data. Sounds great. All right, Sounds man, well, I'm going to stop, uh, stop the recording. And I'm going to uh, – actually, I'll go ahead and hang up Skype so that they'll end.